Good afternoon, Bible students. So we're in Romans chapter 11 as we start today. And uh, we've been talking in chapters 9, 10, and 11. Paul has been addressing the big question, one that deeply troubled him, you can tell. What about the Jewish people who did not accept the Jewish Messiah when he came? Jesus of Nazareth, the anointed one of God, the Davidic king who would restore all things, came and they rejected him. They said it wasn't him. They're looking for somebody else, not Jesus. And it deeply troubles Paul, who believes that salvation alone comes through faith in Jesus Christ. What about Israel? If, as is clearly the case by the time he's writing this letter in the early 60s, most Jews are not going to accept Jesus as the Messiah. Instead, the people who are flocking into the communities he's founding are Gentiles, non-Jews. And we got up to uh, the 25th verse of the 11th chapter. So turn to Romans 11, chapter 25. Romans chapter 11, verse 25. And this is the last bit. Now remember, he's talking to Christians who are of a Gentile background. He, he expressly said that this part He's talking to Gentiles who become believers in Jesus, not Jews. But he's talking about the Jews. And he warned in the last bit we looked at, don't get on a high horse thinking, oh, those Jewish branches have been broken off so I, a Gentile branch, can be grafted into Israel. Don't get on a high horse about that and think that's all something. God has done it, not you. You got nothing to brag about. But now he's going to go even further and say, this is all part of a great plan of God that will save them. So, okay, so we're at verse 25. Lest you be wise in your own sight, you Gentile Christians, lest you be wise in your own, own sight, I do not want you to be unaware of this mystery, brothers. A partial hardening has come upon Israel until the fullness of Gentiles has come in. Now, this hardening is like the hardening of the heart you read about in the book of Exodus, where Pharaoh's heart is hardened. He can't respond to Moses' request because his heart is hardened. And although it is a mystery exactly how you and I as Christians should understand it, God has something to do with his hardening of Pharaoh's heart. And here the hardening has come upon these, these Jews, these Israelites, who have not accepted Jesus as the Messiah. Paul doesn't go into details, and I don't want to go further than he does. He just says... In some mysterious way, this hardening of the, of the Jews has come upon them until the fullness of the Gentiles have come in. So that this is all part of a great plan to save both Gentiles and Jews for Paul. God's doing. 26. And in this way, all Israel will be saved. All Israel. Now, I think what he means there is both Jews who are Israel and Gentiles who become part of Israel. Remember the olive stump is the is Israel and the Jews are, are some are broken off so the Gentiles can be grafted in. That whole new tree with its grafted branches is Israel. So I think he means all Israel, both Jews and Gentiles who put their faith in Christ. I believe is what he means here. All Israel will be saved as it is written. The deliverer will come from Zion. He will banish ungodliness from Jacob, and this will be my covenant with them when I take away their sins. Now there, Paul is quoting from Isaiah verse, uh, chapter 59, verse 20 and 21. Uh, the deliverer there is obviously Jesus, who is going to come in Isaiah's prophecy 700 years earlier. Uh, will come from Zion. He'll banish ungodliness from Jacob, another name for Israel. And this will be my covenant with them when I take away their sins. So the deliverer, Jesus, comes to Israel, all those who place their trust in God, and uh, their sins are forgiven. Their sins are taken away, literally, in the Isaiah words just quoted. Verse 28, as regards the gospel, they are enemies for your sake. But as regards election, they belong, they are beloved for the sake of their forefathers. 
So he says, okay, the gospel, sharing the good news about Jesus being the Messiah who's come to die and rise again and faith in whom gives salvation. That's the gospel for, for Paul. Because they haven't accepted the gospel, they've become enemies of the Christians, I guess you could say, of God. Sorry, enemies of God because they haven't accepted Jesus. But that's not the end of the story. They are beloved because of their forefathers. They are descendants of Moses and Aaron and Jacob and all those guys, right? Um, so that they are still beloved of God. They are not enemies of God in that sense because they're beloved of God. All right. Um, for the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. Now that's very important. God made promises to the Jewish people, to the Israelite people, and God's promises can never be broken. God made them promises that they would be a blessing to the world, and they will be. God made them promises that they would have a home with him, and they will have. God's promises are 100% sure and irrevocable, so they can't be lost ultimately. Temporarily, they can be hardened, yes, for Paul, but not lost for just as you were at one time disobedient to God, but now have received mercy because of their disobedience, so they too now have become disobedient in order that by the mercy shown to you, they also may now receive mercy. He says, okay, the disobedience of the Jews, not believing in Jesus, gave an open door for you Gentiles to come in and believe Jesus and to become part of Israel. But because that happened... Now it's going to go the other way. You're going to somehow be a mechanism, you Gentiles, to bring the Jews in to restored relationship with God. He doesn't go into exactly how it's going to happen, but he has confidence that it will happen because God's promises to the Jewish people cannot be broken. All right. 32. For God has consigned all to disobedience that he might have mercy on all. Once upon a time, you Gentile Christians were disobedient. Now some of the Jews are disobedient. But that all for Paul in some mysterious way, I don't think he knows quite what he's thinking here, but we, and we can't know for sure what he, exactly what he means. But he has a confidence that God will have mercy on all Jews and Gentiles. Okay? 32. Now when he ponders this mercy of God that extends to everybody, it just blows them away this mercy of God that overwhelms him. And he says, oh, the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. That's just amazing, right? And he says, wow. Oh, the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable his ways. Inscrutable means you can't, you, the harder as you try to think about them, you can't figure them out. When something's inscrutable, you think, what? I don't get it. And there are times when we look at God and we say, I don't know what you're doing, God. You know, Paul trusts that he loves, that he has mercy, that he saves. But that doesn't mean he's always going to know what the heck he's doing. <laughs> His ways are inscrutable. We can't figure them out. Verse 34 is, again, a quote from Isaiah. Lots of quotes from Isaiah, chapter 40, verse 13. As I'm sure I've mentioned multiple times, in the New Testament, the most quoted book is the Psalms. The second most quoted book of the Old Testament is Isaiah. And this is another one of the great servant songs of Isaiah. For who has known the mind of the Lord and who has been his counselor? Or who has given a gift to him that he might be repaid? And again, he's talking about who can give advice to God. God is all-knowing, all-wisdom, all just, all loving, and all powerful. So who could possibly be an advisor to God? Um, who could give a gift to God who has everything? So, you know, Paul, again, is just thinking, I don't understand what God's doing here. I trust him. I know and love that he will do the right thing. I know and love him, and I know he'll do the right thing, and it's all going to work out because God is mercy on all. So he just sort of hands it over to God, you might say, and says, you got it, God. I don't know how, but you've got it. 36. And for him and through him and to him are all things. Everything's God. It's all going to be according to his will. 
To him be glory forever. So that last bit there is, is an example of a doxology, glory words uh, in Greek. Doxa is glory. Uh, logos is word. So doxology are glory words. Paul often finishes a long discussion with just praise and glory to God. Uh, doxology. And here it is. For him and through him and to him. For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Doxology. After this, he's going to make a pivot. Chapter 12 begins a section on Christian living. He's been talking about all kinds of stuff, big theological topics, really explaining the faith to people. Now he's going to say, now that you have this faith in Christ, how should you live? The rest of the book is going to be mostly focused on this, how you live, ethics, Christian ethics. So we're going to stop this lecture. The next one will begin chapter 12. God bless.